Hello, dear students. Today we will start with Lecture 6, uh, a continuation of psycholinguistics. And we will study further. In the last uh, lecture, we studied about sensory uh, workings. So today uh, we are going to continue that. Now, today we are going to study about working memory. Now, working memory. Sensory, we spoke about that, the vision, and how our sensors work. Now, working memory. The second type of memory has been traditionally referred to as short-term memory, SDM. And more recently as working memory, WM. Now, although the meaning of the words are similar, there is a subtle difference between them. So even though they are similar, they sound the same, working memory or short-term memory. But working memory would be a little different from short-term. Short-term memory is when you just remember some things very slightly and just from the recent past. And you forget easily. That would be your short-term memory. Now working memory is constantly when you are uh, thinking about things, memorizing them and your memory process is working. Now, the need for short-term storage is easy to state. If we need uh, to remember something just temporarily and uh, it doesn't make an effect on our uh, thoughts, then that would be short-term uh, memory and would go into short-term storage. The contents of the sensory stores are held for at most a few seconds. So when we were talking about how um, our sensors in the previous lecture, how our sensors store, um, if we see a slide, we, do, we did an example. And there was an experiment in which the uh, people were supposed to see a chart and memorize the numbers and the rows of numbers. So if the sensory stores are held at most for a few seconds, like if just for a few seconds, that would be short-term memory. The very small amount of time that we've seen the slides and then we have to remember the numbers. But many cognitive acts require that we hold on to information for longer periods of time. So sometimes there are so many acts uh, that happen in our daily lives also that um, make us, and some cognitive acts also, that um, instruct us to use, to hold on to the information or keep that memory for a longer period. Now, for example, when, like your childhood memories, now you get flashes of those memories. Because your brain is constantly working and you are uh, observing and uh, things day by day, from the time that you're a child to, to the time that you grow up. Now, because of that, most of the time, it uh, is very difficult for you to memorize every single thing. So, for that reason, then uh, sometimes we sort of forget most of the stuff. And what we remember is flashes of memory. So even in our childhood, we would remember a certain event that happened at a start, certain age, but the rest would be all blank. So um, we do store memory for longer periods of time. Now, many apparently simple acts, such as solving problems in your head, mentally retracing a path after losing your keys, remembering the topic of a conversation after a distraction, etc., now, these are all things that we would maybe use for uh, store, our brain stores all of these memories for a longer period of time. Now, for example, like many simple, apparently simple acts. Now, when we are solving problems in our head, if we have um, to make a decision or we have to um, find a solution for something, that's when we are solving problems. Now, mentally retracing a path after losing our keys, we would, if we um, re lose our keys in the house somewhere, we'll try to find it. So, mentally, we are doing what we are doing. We are doing that thing, either problems in our mind, or we are doing some problems, or we are doing some problems, or we are doing some problems, or we are So, we are using our memory. We lose our keys. We have to go to the house, so we have to go to the house, step by step, we have to go to the house. And that's how we uh, would retrace our steps and 
रिमेंबर ओ दैट्स वेर आई पुट इट और फिर आपको चीज आपकी मिल जाती है फॉर एग्जाम्पल कीज ना रिमेंबर इन द टॉपिक ऑफ अ कॉन्वर्सेशन आफ्टर अ डिस्ट्रैक्शन आपको बीच में कोई डिस्ट्रैक्शन हो गई है ठीक है आप बात कर रहे हैं किसी से यू आर हैविंग अ कॉन्वर्सेशन विद समबडी एंड सडनली समबडी लेट्स से द ह्यूज जॉइन नो इज अ बैंड गोज बाय इन अ मार्च और समथिंग एंड यू लूज ट्रैक और समबडी हैज प्लेड म्यूजिक लाउडली इन द नेक्स्ट रोड रूम एंड दैट वुड डिस्ट्रैक्ट यू फ्रॉम द कॉन्वर्सेशन दैट यू आर हैविंग and at that time you remember you use your memory your working memory to uh, think back about what you were talking about and both of us out hum log baat karte karte beech mein se koi distraction aaye some interruption hua and we forget but then we retrace we think about it we keep silent for a minute we think about it and then we retrace our conversation and we fi- uh, remember what we were doing so all of these are in fact a complex series of decisions and it is necessary to have a temporary holding place for intermediate decisions so sometimes in our brain we need a place to store the memory to store all the thoughts or all the events that are going on in the day so that is a natural process that every human being goes through that we uh, store our memories or our thoughts in our mind and uh, later on we would deliver them so we do need a, a, most of the time there are some so many different uh, difficult and complex decisions we have to make also now short term memory is severely limited in size or capacity it can hold approximately 7 plus or minus 2 items of information so uh, short term memory when we differentiate it from our long term memory long term memory would be that we recall events that happened in the past yani hum purani cheeze bhi yaad kar lete hain that would be long term memory short term memory would be very limited maximum approximately 7 or plus or like 5 to 7 or minus 2 items of information so panch se saat infor- type of information some short term memory mein store kar sakte hain now as a consequence we cannot take in a string of digits such as these that you see 0658 48 34507159 one 18 now why don't you students try to memorize that do you think if you can just see this in a minute and then you don't look at it can you memorize it for me it would be very difficult i can try to do it but i don't think that uh, as a consequence when we it's short term memory now this is like because i'm seeing it at the moment that i can uh, see these numbers but i can't memorize all of the whole slide and string of the whole digits like 0658483 and that's it i can't remember the rest because that is my short term memory so 5 to 7 digits i can remember the rest i can't and then repeat it verbatim unless we reduce the strain on short term memory so then repeating the same number without even looking at it would be very difficult so as an exercise uh, students i would like you to um try to memorize these numbers and see if your short term memory works or not just look at it for a few seconds and then try to repeat the whole thing so one way to do this is by chunking so i can chunk it i can like put uh, the words in material uh, together like i can make a bunch out of it instead of a full string of the digits i can say 065848 so that i can remember 065848 my short term memory works then uh, 345071 345071 once again my short term memory is working so when you practice it when you chunk the things together jod dete hain aap jab usko bunch kar dete hain that's how you could uh, possibly attempt it so in which we group individual pieces of information into larger units so in this what we do is we group uh, these uh, individual pieces hum chote chote pieces ko individual jod ke chunks mein and then hum usko bade larger unit mein yaad kar sakte 
So 0658-48-345071. Now, if I memorized it in two chunks, I can memorize it together. And you can do that also, any human being. But if I'm told to remember the whole thing, that would be difficult. So with a little practice, nearly everyone can learn to chunk a 18-digit number into units such as 065-848-345 and 071-591-918. So this is chunking. They made smaller chunking. I did about six letters at a time to chunk it together and memorize the digits but they've done it in a format of three. So with a little practice, everyone can memorize it. But all of this memorizing and uh, thinking is like it goes, it's a part of how your brain works and processes language. Be it digits, be it words, same thing. Even when you are students memorizing for your exams, at that time you, are, you memorize pieces and chunks. And at that time, you are using your memory. So when you go to your exams to write everything down, that's the long time term memory. So you're using your thoughts and your brain, your memories, to remember the language. Now, this arrangement is much easier to remember, at least for me, since uh, these are the phone numbers of two of my children. So that was a joke that, yes, those numbers could be um, mentioned or remembered because uh, to the writer, those numbers were the children's numbers. So for this person, it was easy to memorize it. Now, working memory differs from short-term memory in that, that the term WM conveys a more dynamic view of memory processes. So working memory is a little different from short-term memory in the way that uh, working memory conveys a more dynamic, more, um, let's say, more extreme of uh, view of the memory processes. And STM, now short-term memory, was usually viewed as a passive repository of information. So it was just a passive thing that just happened at a certain stage. Now, working memory has both storage and processing functions. So, now the storage function, the processing function and the storage function. Now, the storage function is similar to the storage credited to short-term memory. We hold on a limited amount of information for a limited amount of time. So, in storage function, what is similar is that credited to short-term memory and we hold a limited amount of information, very small amount of information. Both thori information hum yaad karte hain, both thori se time ke liye. Uske baad hum usko phool jate So that would be your storage function in a short-term memory. Now the processing function. The processing function is related to the concept of processing capacity. Processing capacity aapki kitni hai, aap kaise process kar sakte hain, kitna process kar sakte hain kisi memory mein. Now processing capacity refers to the total amount of cognitive resources we may devote to a task. And this amount is assumed to be limited. So processing capacity hamari kya ho gai? It refers to the amount of cognitive resources and that we may devote to a task and this amount is assumed to be limited. So, because this amount is limited, hi hai, so we cannot say that this is a memory aapke use kar So, it is a concept of the total uh, way we um, amount of cognitive resources that we would devote to a task. Like for certain, if I want to memorize something, then I would use a very certain amount of my cognitive resources to memorize that. So, <clears throat> in working memory, now the, for, for example one, if we take an example of suppose you are asked to multiply eight times four in your head. Now, if I ask you students right now to multiply eight times four in your head, this would pose no problem because it's very easy. Just two digits, eight into four. So, but if the numbers were 84 and 67, the task would be much more difficult. So in a second, like if I ask you, like 8 times 4, 
how much does that come out to? But if I ask you suddenly to just immediately tell me 84 uh, times 67, what does that mean? Now, only somebody who's a math genius, I think, can uh, tell you in seconds. Some uh, human beings have the ability of calculating and memorizing very fast and solving such things uh, fast, but they are very rare. A common person like you and me, it would be very difficult for us. So uh, part of your processing capacity would be devoted to performing the arithmetic operations of multiplying 4 by 7. And part of this capacity would be needed to retain the result 28 in temporary storage while you multiply 8 by 6. So in this, why is it difficult? You could, aapka half of the brain is working on memorizing eight part for 84 out of 80, uh, 67. So if we write it um, 87 on top and 64 on the bottom, then we say that we would multiply uh, 7 by 4, which would be 28. So we would put 8 on the bottom, carry the 2. Then vice versa, we would be doing 8 by 6 and pl uh, also plusing the 2 in it. And that's how we would come to the answer. So ultimately, these two functions would be in conflict with one another and competing uh, for the same limited pool of resources. So ultimately, these two functions would be in conflict that they wouldn't match. It wouldn't be easy for the brain to process this information. And uh, competing for the same limited pool of resources. So that our limited pool of resources is how much our, we can store in our memory. Now, if we are using short-term memory or long-term memory, then it's uh, that's where it uh, would come here, that we have a limited pool. So, uh, working memory, if we go with an another example. So, alpha span. Now, what is alpha span? Alpha span, words are presented in random order, but must be recalled in alphabetic order. So, that would be like, if, for example, if I tell you to memorize A, D, F, G, C, B, E. So that would be in random order, out of order. Any sequence may not be, order may not be. So, aapko, lekin main ye kahun ke maine ye lafs bol diye hain. Ab mujhe isi ko aap alphabetical order mein de do. So that's where, uh, what is called alpha span. So aap usko, yani alphabetical order mein A B C D is tarah karke aap uh, alphabetical order mein karein. Now, to do that is very difficult, memorizing it and trying to perform that task. Now, uh, in methodologies, if we uh, go about looking at uh, the psycholinguistic methodologies, uh, if we study a little bit, we'll take a break in uh, the working memory and discuss about behavioral tasks right now. Now, many of the experiments conducted in psycholinguistics, especially earlier on, are behavioral in nature. So uh, in these types of studies, subjects are presented with linguistic stimuli and asked to perform an action. So what are the experiments that are behavioral in nature? Mein. Now, as these studies, mein, as the types of studies, mein, subjects are presented with linguistic stimuli. Any subjects are the people who are, uh, the experiment is being conducted on unko linguistic stimuli and asked to perform an action or unko uh, present kiya jata hai kisi linguistic stimuli ke saath and unko kaha jata hai ki perform this action. So, for example, they may be asked to make a judgment about a word, lexical decision, reproduce the stimulus or name visually presented word aloud. So, sometimes aap usi ko ye kar sakte ke unko maybe uh, we would ask them in that experiment to make a judgment about a word, lexical decision, aapka word ka judgment, uska meaning kya hai, reproduce the stimulus, usko reproduce karna, or name visually presented words aloud. Aapko visually dikha diya gaya, aur aapko kahe ke aap usko repeat kar dhe. So in this, uh, reaction times to respond to the stimuli, usually uh, on the order of milliseconds, 
and proportion of correct responses are the most often employed measures of performance in behavioral tasks. So behavioral tasks में सबसे ज़्यादा reaction time जो है वो आपको uh, stimuli को respond करने का होता है. Now usually on the order of milliseconds से नहीं, you just have to take a few seconds to solve it. And proportion of correct responses are the most often employed measures. So how many correct answers you've gotten out of that, that also is measured. Now such experiments often take advantages of printing effects whereby a priming word or phrase appearing in the experiment can speed up the lexical decision for a related target word later. So sometimes such experiments would take advantage of printing effects like usme advantage hoga whereby a priming word or phrase appearing in the experiment sometimes koi aisa word priming word ho gaya ya koi phrase ho gaya jo appear hua aapke experiment mein wo aapke lexical decision karne mein aapko uh, it'll help you reach the target uh, word related target word later thoda sa thar ke now as an example of how behavioral methods can be used in psycholinguistics research, Fisher, once again a researcher, in 1977 investigate a word using the lexical decision task. So unone behavioral methods ko ab example liya uska of how they can be used in psycholinguistics research. Hum psycholinguistics mein behavioral methods ko kaise use kar sakte So 1977 Mayfisher Fisher investigate here and he saw how to use the lexical decision task. Ab wohi example ke hum lexical decision kaise karein word choice ya word ko samajhne ki. Now she asked participants to make decisions about whether two strings of letter were English words. Now what she did was she asked them are those words in English or in some other language? So sometimes the strings is actual English words requiring a yes response and other times they would be non-words requiring a no response. So sometimes strings jo hai actual words mein would require karti hai a yes response mein. And other times it would be non-words requiring no response. Yani koi aise words nahi hai jo English ke nahi hai. Agar English ke words hai, they will give a response by saying yes, they are. But if they are words that are not from the English language, then the uh, people under the experiment would uh, say that they wouldn't give any response because they won't have to say yes in that. They don't even know if, what those words are. So a subset of licit words was rela were related semantically while others were non-related. So semantically, once again, uh, the study of the meaning of the words. So a subset of licit words uh, were related semantically. Sometimes as a subset banaya gaya usse milte julte words ka jo semantically jinka meaning uh, was the same but while others were not related. Kuch ke meanings milte hoye the aur kuch ke nahi. Relate hi nahi karte the. Now Fisher found that related word pairs were responded to faster when compared to relay unrelated word pairs. Uh, related word pairs unko jaldi response kiya. They compared to unrelated word pairs. Now what are word pairs? Students, I would like you to study some word pairs and tell me the different types of word pairs that you could come up with and see that if it's easier to memorize those or memorize the words that are unrelated to word pairs. Now this facilitation suggests that semantic re relatedness can facilitate or encoding. So um, sometimes this facilitation suggests that semantic relations, uh, some meaning is related to it or trying to understand. Encoding is when we are listening. Uh, when we are delivering something to a person. So at that time they are encoding with the language. Now <coughs> recently if we study the eye movements in psycholinguistics. Now recently eye tracking has been used to study online language processing. So sometimes we uh, use eye tracking and we are using it to see how we can differentiate in the language process. Now beginning with Rayner 
in 1978, the importance of eye movement during reading was established. So while reading, the importance of eye movement moving from one to another place. The same thing when you look, when your eyeballs look from one corner to the other corner. That's the eye movement. And uh, eye movement during reading was established also. Now later, Tenehaus et al. in 1995 used a visual word, paradigm, to stunt the uh, cognitive process says related to spoken language. Now later on, they used the visual word, paradigm, to uh, stun the cognitive processes. They used to stop 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 the cognitive processes. Now, assuming that eye movement are closely linked uh, to the current focus of attention, language processing can be studied by monitoring eye movements while a subject is presented auditory with linguistic input. Now, if we assume that the eye movement is closely linked to uh, the current focus of attention, se, then language processing can be studied by monitoring eye movements. So, then we can study eye movements with language processing while a subject is presented auditory with linguistic input. Also, while we present that subject karte hain, auditory, matlab, something that he can hear uh, with linguistic input. So we see the movement of your eyes while you read and that is all a focus of attention. How you process the language by reading it. Further on, in psycholinguistics, language production errors. Now we want to be very clear about it. The reason why I have just written a little bit on this slide is to explain it further. Language production errors, the errors that, the mistakes that we make while producing language. Now the analysis of systematic errors in speech, writing and typing of language as it is produced can provide evidence of the process which has generated it. So analysis hum systematic errors uh, jab dekhte hain speech mein, when we have systematic uh, analyze that, that we have mistakes in our speech, in our writing, and uh, typing of language, then as it is produced can provide evidence of the process which has generated it. So then we see what process we went through, why did it generate this uh, evidence, and why was it, uh, why did we conduct these errors or uh, these mistakes. So while producing language, we make a lot of mistakes. Now, for example, let's say I could be uh, speaking about something and maybe I would mispronounce a word or misspell a word when writing it. Now, those are language production errors. Now, a human being uh, would can make those, even though if he knows um, the answer, correct answer to it, he can still make those mistakes. Now you can, in, if you get confused, let's say, from a distraction, then you would make the same mistake also of generating those errors. So what psycholinguistic studies is how those errors are conducted and why the brain makes those errors. By the time we are thinking those thoughts and bringing it uh, into the form of speech or speaking it, at that point, what came in between that made a huge difference that uh, caused those mistakes. Now, uh, when we think about what caused those mistakes, we go to neuroimaging. Now, neuroimaging would be that uh, until the recent advent of non-invasive medical techniques, brain surgery was the preferred way for language researchers to discover how language works in the brain. As a pehle ke non-invasive medical techniques aayi uh, is world mein, sabse pehle, bhoat purane door mein, brain surgery was the preferred way. Yani, uh, language researchers, they conducted brain surgeries just to find out how the language works in the brain. For example, severing the corpus collu uh, callosum, the bundles of nerves that connects to two hemispheres of the brain, was at one time a treatment for some forms of epilepsy. 
सकते हैं एपिलेप्सी का जो फॉर्म था उसकी जो इलनेस थी एट दैट टाइम एपिलेप्सी की इलनेस के लिए समटाइम्स उन्होंने कॉर्पस कलोसम जो है जो बंडल्स हैं आपके नर्व्स के आपके नर्व एंड्स दैट कनेक्ट टू द टू हेमिसफेयर्स ऑफ द ब्रेन द टू साइड्स ऑफ द ब्रेन वाज एट वन पॉइंट अ ट्रीटमेंट फॉर इट Now researchers could then study the ways in which the comprehension and production of language were affected by such a drastic surgery. So most of the time researchers ये चीज study कर सकते थे कि why um, they have to um, comprehend and how they comprehended, how they understood or how they uh, produced the language and how it was affected by such drastic surgery. Or as a drastic surgery से क्या फर्क पड़ा? Now, where illness made brain surgery necessary, language researchers had an opportunity to pursue their research. So, ये नहीं होता था कि the doctors would or the researchers would just take a patient, a volunteer, and cut through their brain or make brain surgery just to find out if um, just to how the language is produced. But if a person already had an illness that concerned the brain. and they were required for brain surgery at that point the language researchers had an opportunity to uh, pursue their research phir wo apni research ko continue kar sakte the sirf agar wo bimar thi yani ye nahi tha ke wo create karke aise victims karte the jinke upar brain surgery karke wo language research kar rahe but wo log jo already bimar hai aur brain surgery ke through ja rahe hain un pe ye conduct research bhi ho jati thi jab uska ilaj ho raha hota tha Now newer non-invasive techniques may include brain imaging by position emission tomography. Now position emission tomography PET ye these are non-invasive techniques. Ye aisa hai jisme yani aapko koi surgery ya koi experiment aapka sirf hota to you're just taking images of the uh, positron uh, emission th therapy of how your brain is positioned at a certain point. Now, functional magnetic res resonance imaging, now fMRI, that's another way of doing it. Then event-related potentials, events that relate to which you have given the potentials, uh, what is causing these things, like ERPs. In uh, electro uh, scan uh, magnetic stimulation, now TMS. Now, electrotranscranial magnetic stimulation would also be a part of this experiment. So sometimes ab nay techniques hain ye. ठीक है, these are terms that only neurosurgeons would know or um, researchers in psycholinguistics would know the answers to. PET, ERP, fMRI, or TMS. So brain imaging technique. Now, in the brain imaging technique, vary in their spatial and uh, temporal resolutions. So, ye vary karti hai uski resolutions mein. Now, each type of methodology presents a set of advantages and disadvantages for studying a particular problem in psycholinguistics. So, each type ye jo method hai, that metholo methodology presents a set of advantages. and disadvantages so advantages bhi hai is methodology mein and disadvantages bhi hai and for this we study a particular problem in psycholinguistics so each type of methodology uske advantages bhi honge uske nuksan bhi honge aur uske fayde bhi honge for studying a particular problem in psycholinguistics sirf psycholinguistics ke problems study karne ke liye So, if we further go on into psycholinguistics, computational modeling. Now, in computational modeling, uh, a computational model in, for example, the DRC model of reading and word recognition, proposed by Coulthard and colleagues, is another methodology. So, a core methodology, the computational model in, take a DRC. It's a model of reading and word recognition. से ये मॉडल रीडिंग से लिंक्ड है और वर्ड रेकग्नाइज करना है पहचानने में इट वाज प्रपोज बाय कोल्ड हार्ट एंड कोलीग्स सो दे स्टडीड दिस नाउ इट रिफर्स टू द प्रैक्टिस ऑफ सेटिंग अप कॉग्निटिव मॉडल्स इन द फॉर्म ऑफ एक्सेक्यूटेबल कंप्यूटर प्रोग्राम्स 
ये चीज प्रैक्टिस जो है इट्स इट हेल्प्स इन सेटिंग अप कॉग्निटिव कॉग्निटिव मॉडल सेटअप करने में हेल्प करती है एंड टू फॉर्म एन एक्सेक्यूटेबल कंप्यूटर प्रोग्राम और एक ऐसा जो है कंप्यूटर प्रोग्राम जिसको एक्सेक्यूट कर सके नाउ सच प्रोग्राम्स आर यूजफुल बिकॉज़ दे रिक्वायर थ्योरिस्ट टू बी एक्सप्लिसिट इन देयर हाइपोथेसिस एंड बिकॉज़ दे आर यूजफुल टू जनरेट एक्यूरेट प्रेडिक्शंस फॉर थ्योरेटिकल मॉडल्स that are so complex that they render discursive analysis unreliable. So sometimes these prog programs are useful because they require theorists to be explicit in their hypothesis and उनके ये नहीं हाइपोथेसिस उनकी जो थॉट्स हैं उनके जो कंक्लुजन्स हैं उसमें उनको थ्योरिस्ट को हेल्प करता है रिक्वायर करता है यूजफुल होता है but because they are useful to generate accurate predictions predictions आप जब किसी चीज़ का प्रडिक्ट कर देते हैं कि ये होने वाला है या इसका ये हल है या इसका ये सोल्यूशन है दैट वुड बी ए प्रडिक्शन सो जनरेट एक्यूरेट प्रडिक्शंस बिल्कुल करेक्ट प्रडिक्शंस आपकी जनरेट हो फोर्थ थ्रेटिकल मॉडल्स एंड थिंग्स दैट रेंडर डिस्कर्सिव एनालिसिस अनरिलाइबल ऐसी चीज़ें जो डिस्कर्सिव एनालिसिस को अनरिलाइबल शो करती हैं सो थिंग्स दैट शो स्टूडेंट्स Uh, so complex that they render discursive analysis ke unko unreliable kar sakte that would be computational modeling now when we go on further we have another example of computational modeling is a maclean's and elman's trace mode of speech perception ab ek aur example aa gayi computational modeling ke bare mein uh, and that would be maclean and elman's trace and unka mode of speech और उसकी परसेप्शन उन्होंने क्या निकाली सो दैट वुड बी अनदर एग्जांपल ऑफ दिस नाउ व्हेन वी गो फर्दर ऑन इन साइकोलिंग्विस्टिक्स द इश्यूज एंड एरियाज ऑफ रिसर्च इन साइकोलिंग्विस्टिक्स नाउ साइकोलिंग्विस्टिक्स इज कंसर्नड विद द नेचर ऑफ द कंप्यूटेशन एंड प्रोसेसेस दैट द ब्रेन अंडरगोस टू कॉम्प्रिहेंड एंड प्रोड्यूस लैंग्वेज सो साइकोलिंग्विस्टिक्स बेसिकली क्या स्टडी कर रही है आपकी साइकोलॉजी of how you produce uh, the computations and how the pro what are the processes that the brain goes through to uh, understand and to produce a language now for example the cohort model seeks to describe how words are retrieved from the mental lexicon when an individual hears or sees linguistic input so for example the cohort model would seek to describe how words are retrieved words kaise retrieve hoti hain from the mental lexicon when an individual hears or sees a linguistic input so jab koi individual uh, sunta hai ya dikhta hai koi mental lexicon create hota hai to see a linguistic input at that time it describes how words are retrieved hum apne mental process mein se words ko kaise retrieve karte hain and how do we memorize them? how do we remember and retrieve it and bring it back to create language now in recent research using non invasive imaging techniques seeks to shed light on just where certain language processes occur in the brain so sometimes in recent research may this is a major thing that non invasive imaging techniques non invasive once again like i said something that does not um have surgery or any damage or any sort of physical uh restraint on checking the brain's um connection with language so we created we take images of the brain we take images of the brain seeing how the brain is positioned at what certain point when we are using the language so these techniques would shed light on where certain language processes occur in the brain so sometimes this would show us by research where the language when we are using a certain language how it's processed and what is the position of the brain at that time now there is no number there are a number of unanswered questions in psycholinguistics psycholinguistics is such a vast field it's very difficult to find all the answers and up till now till the current day people and scientists are still researching and every day they discover a new thing and they discover the new psycholinguistics such as uh, there are a number of unanswered questions 
in psycholinguistics such as whether the brain uh, the human ability to use syntax is based on innate mental structures or em uh, emerges from interaction with other humans and whether some animals can be taught the syntax of human language so students as I was saying that the recent research would say that in non evasive techniques um, Invasive imaging technique seeks to shed the light on just where certain language processes occur in the brain. Now, there are n a number of unanswered questions in psycholinguistics. Like I told you, there is psycholinguistics is a vast field, and it is very difficult to decide uh, and research all the different aspects of psycholinguistics. Now, there are, up till the current day, like I said, there are so many researchers still researching psycholinguistics and they're learning new things. Now, such as whether the human ability to use syntax is based on the innate mental structures, um, like how we structure a language or how we structure a sentence, and what is the human ability to do that, is based on innate mental structures or emerges from interaction with other humans. So sometimes, yehi cheez jo hai, hum human ability dekhte hain ke wo kaise structure karte hain sentence ko. How do they create the sentence? And it's based on the innate mental, the inner mental structures. Aapke dhamaag ki andar jo structures hain. Or emerges from interaction with other humans. Ya phir dousre humans ke saath interact jab aap karte hain when you're having a conversation. And whether some animals can be taught the syntax of human language. And sometimes, uh, we experiment also and there are so many experiments going on that if uh, some animals can be taught the syntax also or the structure of uh, the language and you could take an example uh, in this by saying that if you like have a pet for example you have um, a dog as a pet in your home now what you are doing is now the dog does not understand human language you see but you teach the dog to do certain acts when you command it. So in a way, the dog hears those sounds and understands that as a command because you've taught him. Like for example, you tell the dog, sit. The dog will sit. Or you would say, down boy, down. So that means you're trying to, the dog will understand you if you're the owner. So, but this happens with time. So sometimes, these, um, we want to see the uh, human ability if we can use it with animals and most of the time we've proved it that when we do have pets we do make them understand. Now the, another good example I would think I just got uh, uh, thinking about it that uh, how animals how could we um, teach them the syntax of human language. Now that is a very simple question how because you've seen the parrots there are so many parrots that, um, the speaking parrots, the ones that you have in your home, and um, you, may, uh, you teach them the language, and they will repeat, they will use the imitation. Now their brains imitate the human language and then store it. So they use their memory to store that, and uh, they repeat whatever the humans have taught them. So, as a parent, you can teach them what they are saying. Now, this is not that they are not learning the language of the human language. He has learned the human language. How did he do it? He has imitated it. How did he do it? He has stored it in his memory and that memory has converted it into language. So, how human beings do that too? When I hear something, a child would do that. A child would um, take a word, pick a word, and uh, hear it from somebody, and then he would pick it, and then he would um, form that, imitate it, and store it in the memory at the same time. And when he's imitating, he's storing it. And when he stores it, that means that there's, that's a collection of words going uh, in the brain, and he's saving those memories. And later on, he learns to use them in sentences. So, two other major subfields of psycholinguistics uh, investigates first language acquisitions. Now, first language acquisition would be when you are learning your native language. The process uh, by which infants acquire language. And second language acquisitions also. 
So the first uh, language acquisition would be the process when you're learning your native language, like for example an infant, a child would acquire language. Usko language seek hai bacha. At that time, wo first language acquisition ho Take a process just may say uh, child guzara hai us language ko hasil karne ke liye yaad karne ke liye wo phir second language acquisition also. Now in addition, it is much more difficult for adults to acquire second languages than it is for infants to um, relearn their first language. So what uh, we would do is that um, this is a misspelling uh, students that infants to learn it should be learn um, their first language now in addition it must be more difficult for adults to acquire so uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand a certain language and how to acquire a second language it would be difficult to learn that language but for a child or a um, young kid it would be very easy to acquire that language um, you can take an example of uh, how we memorize the language by for example jab, um, Aapki daily life se aap usko concern kar sakte example ko that uh, when we uh, usually we grow up speaking like you grew up speaking Urdu as your native language and then you start learning to read the Quran now when you are reading the Quran you are reading it in Arabic so you go to the mosque and you study how to uh, learn Arabic now Arabic is not your mother tongue so um, that would be a part when learning for an adult is difficult now if I want to go and memorize something or learn Arabic it's going to be difficult for me to go and learn it at this age so that's the reason why our parents send our children at a younger age to go and learn to read the Quran because at that point infants it's easy for children to learn a second language than it is for an adult now same thing uh, when we why do we say that our schooling has to the base has to be strong if we learn English at uh, early stage in our younger classes in our younger grades it would be easier for the children to remember it to memorize and learn the language and later on when they come in college or university by that time their English is so good that they don't have difficulty learning it but now some of you let's say that um, have don't have a background of English like your schooling was uh, also in order the medium and you didn't study English now when you come to your college or your university and you start learning and every subject is in English at that point it is very difficult for you to learn that as a second language so your second language acquisition would be very difficult but if you had learned it at a younger age it would have been easier for you now the sensitive periods may exist during which language can be learned readily so sometimes but yes uh, even when we grow up there are such uh, periods in our life that would maybe help us learn the language uh, more easily so a great deal of research in psycholinguistics focuses on how this ability develops and diminishes over time so बहुत ज़्यादा research हमारी जो है वो psycholinguistics की focuses इस चीज़ पे इस चीज़ पे focus करती है कि वो ability के over time हम कैसे develop करते हैं और diminish करते हैं उस चीज़ को so it also seems to be the case that the more languages one knows the easier it is to learn more अब sometimes ये भी हो सकता है कि आपको जब languages सीखने का time आता है वह अगर आपको already languages आती हैं तो it will be easier for you to learn more now a very good example of that is me myself now when I came to Pakistan I did not know how to speak Urdu but because in my bachelor's and my master's I had already learned four languages so when I came to Pakistan I started learning Urdu and at that point when learning Urdu it was easier for me to pick the language because I already had a background of learning more languages and it was more easier for me to pick this language and learn it so um, for me to learn Urdu was more simpler because I already had learned a lot more 
different languages and I was already in the process of learning even though that I was an adult. So the field of FSology deals with language deficiency that arise because of brain damage. And now we, were, we had studied this also, that FSology, now it is um, a part that um, language deficiency that um, a default in learning the language that may cause brain damage, um, because of brain damage, that it is, we don't learn the language properly. So sometimes there is an illness that also uh, affects our language learning. But for normal human beings, it's very easy. So, but at a best part would be when you were a child to learn a second language. If not, then you need to learn. If you have the ability to learn more languages, then it becomes easier to learn more further on. Now, studies in aphasiology uh, can both offer advances in therapy for individuals suffering from aphasia. Aphasia, which is an illness in which you are deficient of language or you are um, falling behind the language and further insight into how the brain processes the language and how your brain would process the language. So if you are losing you have to, there are so many therapies going on. When people are affected with a certain brain disease, there are so many diseases that affect our language. So, aphasiology, aphasia is one of them. And if they are uh, suffering from that, then it would be more easier to maybe study how the brain processes the language in people who are uh, suffering from any brain damage or any sort of illness. Now, phonetics uh, in psycholinguistics, another part of uh, it is phonetics. Now, phonetics it deals with, um, is a branch of linguistic that comprises the study of sounds of human speech, or in the case of sign language, the equivalent aspects of sign. So, phonetics wo cheez hai jo aapke human speech, aapka bolne ke, speaking ke way koi sounds ko record, comprise karti hai. And in the case ke agar sign language hai, people who are hearing impaired or mute or can't hear, uh, for them sign language. So, the signs that we use by our hands also is a part of phonetics. Now, it is concerned with the physical properties of speech sounds or signals. So, ye un physical properties se concerned hai, jo speech sounds and signals correlate karti hai. Now, there is psychological production, acoustic properties, auditory perception, and neuropsychologic status. Ab isme kya cheezen wo kar rahi hai, physical properties of speech sounds and signals? There is psychological production. Psychologically, aap kaise produce kar rahe hai language ko? The way you are producing a language. Acoustic properties, how you hear the whatever uh, hearing um, processes you're using. Acoustic would relate to your hearing. Auditory perception, also hearing and speaking. And neuropsychologic status. And how your brain will function while developing a language or uh, trying to understand the sounds of the human speech. So, in phonetics, uh, once again, then that is the study phonology. Now, phonology, on the, on the other hand, is concerned with the abstract grammatical characterization of system of sounds or signs. So, phonology be a part of psycholinguistics, and it studies an opposite from phonetics. Phonetics is uh, just dealing with the sounds of the speech, and phonology is concerned with the abstract grammatical characterization of systems of sounds and signs. So how we grammatically use those sounds or how we use the signs to show proper grammar usage. Now the field of phonetics is multiple layered subject of linguistics that focuses on speech. So phonetics ke jo field hai, it's a part of psycholinguistics and linguistics and it is a multi-layered subject. And it's both are layers, and that means it's a very vast study. And what it does is it focuses on speech. Aapki speech pe focus karti ye study. Now, in case of oral language, there are three basic areas of studies. 
अब अगर हम ओरल लैंग्वेज को सिर्फ देखें सो थ्री बेसिक एरियाज है स्टडीज की जो फनेटिक्स के नीचे जो है ना अंडर आएंगे फर्स्ट पार्ट वुड बी आर्टिकुलेटरी फनेटिक्स एक्स्टिक्स फनेटिक्स एंड ऑडिटोरी फनेटिक्स Now, articulatory would be related to your vocal tract or how you speak, how you pronounce the word, the sounds that come out of your throat from your vocal box. So, articulatory phonetics, the study of production of speech sounds by the articulatory and vocal tract by the speaker. So, your vocal tract, your tract, is through your sounds. Okay, in which you speak. Okay, your speech sounds. Okay, your speech sounds. Okay, your speech sounds. Okay, your speech sounds. जो बोलने वाला है उसके उसकी प्रोडक्शन कैसे होती है अक्यूस्टिक फिनेटिक्स द स्टडी ऑफ फिजिकल ट्रांसमिशन ऑफ स्पीच साउंड्स फ्रॉम द स्पीकर टू द लिसनर अक्यूस्टिक वुड बी अ द हियरिंग प्रोसेस अब वो फिजिकल ट्रांसमिशन क्या है स्पीच साउंड्स की फ्रॉम स्पीकर टू लिसनर बोलने वाले से सुनने वाले तक आपकी स्पीच कैसे जाती है कैसे पहुंचती है थ्रू विच वेव्स That is um, acoustic phonetics, and uh, it studies the physical transmission of how one person speaking can transfer to the listener. Now, auditory phonetics, that's the another third part, the study of the reception and perception of speech sounds by the listener. So, ye kya kar raha hai auditory phonetics? It's studying the reception and the perception of speech sounds. अब जो सुनने वाला है हाउ इज ही रिसीविंग और परसीविंग द स्पीच साउंड्स वो समझ कैसे रहा है एंड वो उसको रिसीव कैसे कर रहा है परसेप्शन वुड बी उसकी अंडरस्टैंडिंग हाउ ही अंडरस्टैंड्स द स्पीच साउंड्स सो ऑडिटोरी फोनेटिक्स वुड डील विद दैट नाउ दीज एरियाज आर इंटरकनेक्टेड थ्रू द कॉमन मैकेनिज्म ऑफ साउंड ये तीनों चीजें दे आर कनेक्टेड साउंड से दे आर ऑल रिलेटेड टू साउंड सच एज वेव लेंथ एम्पलीट्यूड एंड हारमोनिक्स सो आपकी साउंड डिलीवर कैसे होता है द मैकेनिज्म ऑफ साउंड वेव लेंथ से ठीक है एम्पलीट्यूड से एंड हारमोनिक्स हाउ दोज वेव लेंथ रीच फ्रॉम द स्पीकर टू द लिसनर इज हाउ द स्टडी So, phonetic was studied, um, if we go into the history of phonetics, phonetic was studied as early as 500 BC. That was so long ago. They studied phonetics in that age. They started learning about language. So, when they were studying in 500 BC in ancient India, with Pagini's account of the place and manner of articulation of consonants in his 5th century BC treatise on Sanskrit. Ab 5th century BC mein, when he was learning the language or he uh, spoke Sanskrit, which is an Indian language, at that time the place and the manner of articulation of the consonants अल्फाबेट के क्या जो है ना प्लेस था क्या मैनर में उनको प्रोनाउंस करना है हाउ आर वी गोइंग टू से वन सिंगल वर्ड सो एट दैट टाइम संस्कृत वाज संस्कृत वाज अ वेरी ओल्ड लैंग्वेज सो द मेजर इंडिक अल्फाबेट्स टुडे ऑर्डर देयर कंसोनेंस अकॉर्डिंग टू पैगिनीज क्लासिफिकेशन सो उस टाइम पे जो उसने रिसर्च की at that time, Pagini classified that research. And Aajkal ki Indian alphabets jo hain, they are un, uh, referred to by their consonants according to that same classification that Pagini gave. So modern phonetics began later on. That was in the previous early stages of the history of phonetics, how phonetics started. Now in modern phonetics, uh, modern phonetics began with Alexander Melville Bell, uh, whose visible speech introduced a system of precise notation for writing down speech sounds. Later on, they were moved on to a stage of phonetics. And at that time, it began with the Alexander McWill, Melville Bell. So, usne visible speech introduce, right? A system of precise notation for writing down speech sounds. Speech sounds ko 
लिखने का how to pronounce so if you students would uh, see um, a book of phonetics you would see different symbols and how we study those symbols to understand how we pronounce like let's say the word a now how do we the that process of uh, introducing that sound of saying it or writing down the speech sounds of a that is the pronunciation now in that pronunciation at that time uh, in the previous ones they had for only indian but later on uh, he started um, realizing introducing a new system to write those sounds down so that we could differentiate it now in phonetic transcription the international phonetic alphabet is used as the basis for the phonetic transcription of speech so international phonetic alphabet jab aaye so at that time it was used as a basic for the phonetic uh, transcription of speech now it is based on the latin alphabet and is able to transcribe most features of speech such as consonants vowels and uh, supramental features now uh, when we see that in the uh, later on in the international phonetic alphabet if you see those books you can see that there was a phonetic transcription of the speech they have given symbols to the words and the sounds and it was based on the latin alphabet now what you are doing nowadays is using the La latin alphabet and it's uh, able to transcribe most of the features of the speech in its main consonants and vowels ko aap differentiate kar sakte you can see the different way the uh, words are pronounced now every documented phoneme available within the known languages in the world is assigned its own corresponding symbol ab har different language mein that is known all over the world usko apna ek sound ka symbol de diya gaya phonetics mein how you would pronounce it the same way in like your urdu alphabet like you know what b sounds for you know what pe is or he these are the words like these have different symbols so how we those alphabets are the symbols of how we pronounce the words so in latin also alphabet it was the same thing and in all different languages all over the world it's the same now in the difference between phonetics and phonology if we go through the difference now phonology concerns itself with system of phonemes phonology system of phonemes ko concern kar rahi hai abstract cognitive units of speech sound or sign which distinguish the words of a language wo cheeze wo cognitive units jo speech ki hain that distinguish sound or sign koi words ko distinguish karti hai fark le batati hai in a language how one word is different from another in a language now phonetics on the other hand concerns itself with the production the transmission and perception of the physical phenomena which are abstracted in the mind to constitute these speech sounds or signs phonology kya kar rahi hai it's a system of phonemes and it shows how to distinguish ke fark hum kaise malum karte hain the sounds of uh, how words are used in a language and what different sounds those words have in phonetics now that concerns itself with the production how we produce the language transmit the language the transmission how we transmit from one speaker to the listener and perception of the physical phenomena which are abstracted in the mind jo aapke mind mein abstracted hai and these uh, constitute these speech sounds or sign and they would refer to speech sounds or signs that you automatically uh, understand from your brain the signals that come from your brain that tell you now using an edison phonograph uh, laura mar herman investigated the spectral properties of vowels and consonants so she made um phonograph is here to understand the investigate the properties of the vowels and the consonants it was in these paper uh, that the terms uh, format was first introduced ye word pehle in papers mein introduce hua now harman also played back vowels recording 
made with Edison phonograph at different speeds in order to test Willis and Watstone theories of vowel production. हम उसने Willis and Watstone की जो है theories को test करना था vowel production के लिए वॉल प्रोडक्शन के लिए जो उन्होंने थ्योरीज दी थी उसको टेस्ट करने के लिए एडिसन ने फोनोग्राफ यूज किया उस पर रिकॉर्ड किया द फोनोग्राफ यूज टू बी ए प्रीवियस इन द ओल्ड टाइम्स इंस्टेड ऑफ लाइक अ टेप रिकॉर्डर दे यूज टू यूज अ फोनोग्राफ सो ही रिकॉर्डेड द साउंड्स एंड देन प्लेड दम एट डिफरेंट स्पीड्स same thing like I would tell you that if you want to start playing if you want to record uh, certain sounds or speech and if you play it slowly slowing the speed of discussion the words would drag and if you play it at a high speed then you might not even understand the words so he played them at different speeds to test the theories of the while production now relation now psycholinguistics the relation to phonology how does psycholinguistics relate to phonology in contrast to phonetic phonology is the study of how sounds and gesture pattern in and across languages relating concerns with other level and aspect of language so uh, phonetic ke bajaye in contrast mein phonology jo hai wo study karti hai sounds and gesture patterns agar aap sign language use kar rahe hain to how, what gestures you use and uh, what sounds and how it comes across in language and relating concerns with uh, other level and aspect of language or the level of concern so kis aspect of language se jo hai aap other level pe you see how it relates now phonetic deals with the articulatory and acoustic properties of speech sound how they are produced and how they are perceived so once again uh, we would say that phonetics deals with the speech sounds phir ke wo unko produce kaise hui hai aur phir then how do you perceive those languages now as a part of investigation phoneticians may concern themselves with the physical properties of meaningful sound contrasts or social meaning encoded in speech signals so sometimes um the phoneticians to have when they investigate a part of a language they would concern themselves with the physical properties the physical properties meaning the meaningful sound contrast how sounds contrast with each other when you're pronouncing words in a language or the social meaning encoded in the speech signals or the social meaning when you are using speech signals now however however the substantial portion of research in phonetic is not concerned with the meaningful elements in the speech signal so while it is widely agreed that phonology is grounded in phonetics phonology is the distinct branch of linguistics concerned with sounds and gesture as abstract unit and their conditioned variations so via for example allophone rules constraints or derivational rules so um when we study about it like it's a part of a portion of a research in phonetic is not concerned with the elements of the speech but it is widely agreed that phonology is grounded in phonetics phir bhi phonology jo hai phonetics se linked hai phonology is the distinct branch of linguistics and it's concerned with sounds and gestures so um and derivational rules now this also is a very wide field we will further go on and study about this later on students and um we will continue this learning about how your working memory goes that we studied today um, how your short term memory works how phonetics is related to psycholinguistics so we will study these further in the next lectures so i hope you will consider all the questions that i put to you and um try to solve them experiment on your own self maybe you will learn more when you experiment experiment on your friends experiment on your own self and then try to understand this methodology so uh for today's le lecture that's uh, all and i will see you in the next lecture goodbye take care